Hello and welcome to Black, Brown, and Bilingue, where our mission is to unite the black and brown communities through education, storytelling, and community engagement. The vision of Black, Brown, and Bilingue is to be part of creating a world in which Black and Brown identities are affirmed, bilingualism and biculturalism are nurtured, and equity is the driving force behind all that we do. Thank you for joining us again today. I am Lisette Jacobson, and I am one of your hosts. And I'm Maurice McDavid. I'm your other host. Our title for today's podcast is The Black, Brown Divide. And I've got to tell you that this is a conversation that really started as a joke between Lisette and I back in graduate school. And it was something that I had not really heard of or heard it called that prior to that moment. Um, but as she pointed it out and joked about it in grad school, I reflected back on childhood and, and other points in life and really could see where this existed. So Maurice, would you like to tell us or the, share with the listeners an example of, of the Black-Brown divide as you were growing up? Yes, I can do that. Let me begin by saying this first. I think that for this episode in particular, it's really important that you understand that Lisette nor myself represent all of black people or all of the Latino community. We are not monoliths. And so if you hear something that you disagree with, please engage with us, Facebook, Twitter, um, any of those areas. But I do want to share with, <laughs> with you a, a funny story, and I'm laughing already. Um, in fact, I got an opportunity to share this story with my cousin just the other day. I was probably in kindergarten, maybe first grade. And I came home and I was talking to my mama and my auntie and I told them that I had a crush on this little Latina girl um, who I actually ended up graduating high school with. And my auntie's response was, you can't like no Mexican. They have like 500 babies. And all of a sudden, as a child, I realized that there was some sort of a divide between the black and brown community. Um, and so that's, that's something that I definitely remember to this very day. Let's say, can you think of anything, you know, growing up that, that had a similar, or where you had a similar experience? For me, I remember being in a car with my friends and I happened to be the only Latina in the car. Everyone else was black. And I hate to be that person where I got all these black friends, but that was just the reality, right? I don't want to be that person. So we were just driving around, hanging out, and there was a Hispanic man or Latino man crossing the street. And someone in the car joked, hey, run him over, run over a Mexican, 200 points. And they all started laughing. And I felt very uncomfortable. And I remember <laughs> saying, hey, but I'm Mexican. And when, then they proceeded to say, yeah, but you're not one of those Mexicans. For me, it was like, wait, but yes, I definitely am. And so that highlighted for me uh, this black-brown divide because I also at home with uncles and cousins and, and, and friends heard a lot of Latinos speak against the African-American community. community. Excuse me. And if you remember from the first episode, I talk about my love for reading. And so I was always at the library. I was always trying to read and expand my knowledge. And I came across a book called The Presumed Alliance by Nicolas Vaca. And I remember stopping and really reflecting on my own childhood 
And it just, I didn't put it down. And the premise of the book is how it is assumed that because we are both quote unquote minority groups, I really don't like that word minority, but, but because we are both minority groups that there's this automatic assumption that we are allies. And that couldn't be further from the truth. And so through this podcast, we thought it would be very important to talk about how African-Americans and Latinos have always had a very uneasy alliance. But we are often afraid or ashamed to talk about it in the open, right? Would you say it's even a little uncomfortable as, as we're starting to speak here because we know that historically, we really do not air our grievances publicly as it relates to the black and brown community. Yeah, the, the, the stories that we've shared so far are really surface level examples mm-hmm. of this black brown divide. And I think that it's important that we uh, share some, some, some things today, Lisette, about how really this goes much deeper than that that this is not something that is just like, oh, our cultures are different, and so we don't necessarily see eye to eye. There are some things that really are are the roots of uh, why uh, this divide exists. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I think when we begin to think about that, one of the first areas that, that, that we'd have to look at is really having an understanding of the American economy, Mm-hmm. And beyond the American economy, looking at the impact of of the American economy on Mexico and the rest of Central and Latin America, and looking at the impact of the American economy on the black community. Mm-hmm. And so I think that economics is another part, right? That that's one of those deeper roots that helps us to to see maybe where there is this this black brown divide. Um, yeah, I, I agree with you. I think economics is perhaps the number one reason why we see the divide. Another reason why we are often reluctant to air out our grievances publicly is because we know that there are politicians who are very opportunistic. And so then they will begin to pander, right? And, and try to further that divide. And so we, we don't want to empower them more or less because then that'll prevent any so, sort of powerful coalition that we could develop. Right. Absolutely. So, so the, the, you know, I think that, 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 that other piece then, right. Um, and, and again, I, I want us to go back and, and hit each of these things um, certainly uh, in, in more depth. But I think that third piece, right, because we've kind of talked about the economics and the politics of it. That third piece is is that social piece. There is a social piece that is related to this black brown divide and and how the cultures differ. Mm-hmm. And and then even within that, looking at the Latino community in particular, there's really such a wide range. You know, if somebody says Latino or Hispanic, in most Americans' minds, they think automatically Mexican. Mm-hmm. But not including Spain, there are, I think, 19 or 20 Spanish-speaking countries just in the Western Hemisphere, right? And so... All of these various communities are here in the United States and have varying levels of interaction with African identity or black identity. And so I think that's something that we can cover as well. Let's 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 then, you know, hit this concept or, or conversation of economics in a little bit more detail. Mm-hmm. One of the things that uh, really is outside of the control of either the black community or the Latino community is is NAFTA, right? The North American Free Trade Agreement. And I remember doing some research on NAFTA and looking at the impact that NAFTA and other trade agreements like it have had on the Mexican economy. The ability for Mexican farmers to be able to compete and bring their goods to market was challenged by the fact that the U.S. has this overabundance, they could come in, undercut, sell cheaper. And so it actually uh, spawned 
this this greater movement of of immigration uh, in the 90s and, and early uh, 2000s. So then what happens? Well, you bring up some excellent points, but really the United States has a long history of exploiting Mexican labor. Uh, after the annexation of Texas in 1845, we see that Mexican immigration was a slow trickle. Um, in fact, many of the Mexicans went into Mexico after all of those territories were, were annexed. But then they come back, right, in 1890 for the mining and the agriculture because they experienced a big boom. Then in 1910, I believe, to 1920, we have a next, or I would say the biggest boom of Mexican immigrants because they were fleeing war and the Mexican Revolution was taking place. And so that attracted, the United States attracted war refugees and migrant workers. But at that same time, there were immigrants coming from Eastern and Southern Europe and Asian countries. And so in this time, we also had the science of eugenics, which we know is not real science. But right. that, that's the, <laughs> that is the time where we start to hear, oh, you know, we can't bring the Eastern Europeans in because they're not like the other Europeans that came before them, or they're not as willing to assimilate. So at that time, Mexicans were described as dirty, definitely not people who you would want in, in the United States. But then they were also described, and this is where that exploitation came in, they were described as positive laborers because they were docile, they were taciturn, they were hardworking, and more likely to put up with unhealthy and demanding working conditions. And then finally, they're like, oh, well, they're not here permanently they're going to come back and forth because that's what the migrant workers did. They would come in and out of the United States. And so it wasn't until the, uh, the Great Depression that everything went bust. And they're like, oh, we got to get rid of these Mexicans. We can't have all these Mexicans here. We barely have enough to, to feed Americans. And so it's that back and forth again, right? So this is kind of that timeline where you're welcome here. Nope, you got to go back. Now you're welcome here. No, you got to go back. And so with the Depression, many Mexicans went back to Mexico, but many Mexican-Americans were deported under repatriation policies. But then what happens after the Depression? Then we have World War II and the U.S. Uh, labor shortages were really the beginning or the impetus for the Bracero program. And that lasted for about 20 years, so 1942 to 1964. And at that time, right, so mind you, they sent all the Mexicans back because of the Depression. Now they're putting out Spanish billboards for recruitment. We want you. Queremos tu trabajo. And so they were saying, come back. We need you. And I was just with my parents this past weekend, and in talking to them, I learned that both of my grandfathers came to the United States. back, they, they were part of that back and forth with the Bracero program. They came a total of 14 times. But after, when it was uh, done away with in 1964, they continued to come, but they came illegally. So they went from being migrant workers who were entering and leaving the country legally to now breaking the law. And so the United States has that long history of, of exploiting black and brown people for their work. And so where, where, where do we see that also? Slavery. And I wish that more people would see that in terms of, um, instead of letting this economic argument divide us, we really have to stop and think and understand that these structures are really exploiting us and, and we're not winning and we definitely won't get where we want to be if we fight amongst each other. Now it's not to be, you know, kumbaya and everything is, is perfect, but I truly believe that instead of fighting with one another, we should be looking at these structures that have been in place for decades. No, incredibly well said. And, and I think that that history is an important part of the conversation. You have to understand 
the, those, those background facts to really get to a place where you can understand today. You know, earlier in conversation, you made the argument, uh, and, and I definitely agree with you, that whether it is migration or immigration, that oftentimes people are making movement in order to try to better their families, in order to try to better uh, 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 create a better situation or to ra- in which they can raise their children. And so, you know, right here in my hometown, there are people who have moved here from Chicago. Uh, and it's interesting because you'll hear similar conversation like you're talking about immigration. Oh, well, those people, they came from Mexico. And, and you can replace Mexico with, oh, those people, they came from Chicago. Mm-hmm. Because the, the, the premise, right, is they have come and they've brought a culture that is different than what was here. But if, if we as Americans cannot understand the premise of coming somewhere because you think it's going to be better, then we've missed out somehow on principles of American history, right? We've missed out on the pilgrims coming for religious freedom. We've, we've missed out on people coming to settle the colonies for economic advantage. That's still the same thing that is motivating these two communities the problem becomes, right, and maybe part of what leads to this divide is if they're coming and looking to perform in the same job mm-hmm. and they're looking in the same industries. So if you're coming and you're looking for factory work because the factories have moved, um, you know, out of Chicago and the factories, uh, you know, there, there are factories moving back from Mexico. So now we've come. And we're looking and competing for the same job. And so that certainly um, is playing a role in, in this divide. And yet they share the similarity of, I'm trying to do something better for my family. Yes. And you, when you talk about, you know, we miss the pilgrims, there are historians who describe the Rio Grande as Ellis Island to Mexicans. What is the difference? That it literally is the Ellis Islands for the Mexican people. And when you talk, I, I'm so glad you brought up that point of, of migration. Could you tell us a little bit about the great migration that took place amongst the, the Black community? Yes. So, so there are actually two different um, kind of eras in time in which you see these, these uh, migrations. And, and so you have initially... Uh, following slavery, you have African Americans who are moving from the South out West because according to law, they are now citizens. And so they should be able to qualify for a plot of land with the Homestead Act um, and uh, work, going out to work for railroads. And of course, that's where you get the story of, of um, you know, John Henry, um, who, who defeats, right, this machine and, and some of these great uh, American tales. But you have this large number of people, uh, African Americans moving from the South to go out West to attempt to settle the land there. Um, and those, that group of people is actually referred to as the Exodusters. Um, and, and, and it ties into that story of Exodus, right? They saw the West as a promised land. And so one of the things that, that we miss out on, and I mentioned this in the episode, in the bonus episode talking about history, is the fact that one in every three cowboys, right? When we think of that cowboy settling the West, one in every three cowboys was African American or Mexican American. Mm-hmm. And so, um, you know, again, that's part of it. But then you later get this part, uh, the, the, the Great Migration, which is Black people moving from the South, moving North into um, cities. And again, what they are attempting to escape is full-blown Jim Crow segregation, right? Where I cannot advance economically. I cannot advance politically. And so I need to go somewhere that is going to be better. And so you see the cities like Chicago and Detroit. What, what of course, happens, um, and, and this is just kind of a, a history side note, what, of course, happens is, is that Black people arrive in these northern cities and discover that racism is not only something that existed in the South, right? And so then all of a sudden you have the race riots of 1918 in the city of Chicago. And 
I think, again, there's a similarity in the experience of, of uh, Mexican immigrants who come to this great promised land. They come to this great place of potential and, and education. And what they find is that th- we're not exactly as we have been sold, right? We're, or as we have been advertised, um, that you you may face some discrimination. You, your children are going to um, be asked to, to, you know, for example, in your case, give up their language. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, again, the, the similarities between our communities really um, needs to be highlighted. Um, and I think one place where it has really attempted to be highlighted is in politics, um, to some degree. <laughs> yes. I remember in the 2008 election, we had Hillary Clinton and Barack Obama. And the Latino vote was something that was widely discussed. And there were many articles written on how Hillary was winning with Latino voters. And that this highlighted the fact that Latinos were not ready for a black president because of their own racial bias. But you touched upon this, Maurice. Latinos are not a monolith. And I think that this is something that complicates right, further complicates civil rights. And and when we strive to improve the lives of of everyone in in this nation, they pointed to Florida when that 2008 election, they pointed to Florida and how Hillary Clinton had won Florida. And, And they showed that as evidence. See, Latinos will never vote for a black man. What you have to remember is that the Latino population in Florida is largely Cuban. And Cubans tend to vote very differently than, than Mexicans even. Because when they come here, it's for very different, they're a very different group. The immigrants that come from Cuba and let's say the immigrants that come from Mexico have vastly different experiences. And so it is not fair to say we'll see, Look at, uh, look at Florida and the Latino vote, that they, they, they would never vote for a black president, when that, in fact, that's, that's not the case. Another thing that I remember, too, just while we're on the topic of Barack Obama, is I, rem- I recall Obama being called the deporter-in-chief because he had deported more undocumented immigrants than even George Bush. And it was a very contentious issue that I, I didn't really think got us anywhere. It did nothing for mending that black and brown relationship. And the next thing, too, most recently, we have the DACA decision. Do you want to tell the listeners about that? Because I joked with you a little bit when I sent you that picture. Right. Yeah. We, we, we again, had started this joke a, a while ago and, and recognized today that it certainly is more than just that joke between you and I, but I think it was very well uh, illustrated, if you would, um, in the photo that you sent me of the DACA decision. It was a photo of the Supreme Court, and I think it speaks even to the idea that black people are not monoliths because it had <laughs> in this 5-4 decision um, in favor of, of DACA, and um, Sonia Sotomayor had voted C, and, and then also uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg had voted C, and then you have Clarence Thomas, Clarence. The, 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 the black man on the Supreme Court, and you have, uh, whether in English or in Spanish, the word is still no. <laughs> and so you see the no sitting there, and and I remember thinking, oh, see, there's that black-brown divide. But I think it, again, speaks to that idea that, you know, he was put on the Supreme Court by a conservative president. Um, he, you know, by a Republican president, to call it out exactly as it is, and understanding that, that black people have voted Democrat over 90% since 1964, I, I believe it is. And, and so you, you really kind of see again that even that representation of diversity there. But, you know, you talked about Obama and, and I just wanted to say until you and I began to engage in conversations like this, I think I also probably at least politically had 
the presumption that there was some type of an alliance because I remember, you know, Obama's campaign not only having yes we can, but there was si se puede. And and so, you know, here I am thinking, yeah, si se puede. Uh, you know, to, uh, nosotros estamos juntos. Um, you know, we're, we're, we're in this together. And, you know, uh, again, uh, having that understanding that, that that is not the case, that that um, there is uh, this, this divide. And I, I think, you know, beyond the beyond the politics and beyond the economics um it does ultimately come back to this this social uh construct right and as much as we can talk about and i hear people say things like you know there's just the human race and i agree with that biologically um and i agree with that as 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 somebody who is a a person of faith i believe that god created man right? And that we all are of that same Mm -hmm. um, blood. But we also understand that the way that we live currently does create culture, and it does create cultural differences, and there are linguistic differences. And and so I I can see times where there are are social divides. Here's here's the question that, that I always ask in terms of whether or not we are socially okay with one another. Would you let your daughter marry somebody of that other race? That's always the question, right? Because because we can talk all types of good game. <laughs> right. We can talk all types of good game. But when it comes down to, do I want that person sitting at my Christmas dinner table? Mm-hmm. It, it, it can change the conversation. Yeah, and, and that is another example of that black brown divide that I remember growing up with, you know, I do have family that would have been appalled at the thought. And I've shared with you before Maurice that the excuse often becomes, well, think about your children, you know, what kind of hardships are they going to experience when really it should be, how can we fight and push to ensure that your kids don't experience what black people are experiencing right now at this moment. And so I think that is an excellent question because you're right. People will talk a good game, but how much, I mean, that's deep. Are you willing to bring that Brown person or that black person into your family? Your auntie would have been like, "Uh uh-uh, too many kids, muchos niños. You ain't got money for all that. You don't have money for all that. What are you going to do? So, so, you know, I want to jump back to a point though, that you made earlier. And that is the, the amount of diversity that exists within the Spanish speaking community. So you mentioned in Florida, uh, there is a huge Cuban population in New York, right? New York city. There is a, a pretty big Puerto Rican population in in Aurora, Illinois, right, Chicago, there is a large Mexican population. And so if we just were to look at just those three and look at the, the differences, even in how they view blackness. Mm-hmm. So I had an opportunity to take this class um, down at my alma mater where I'm celebrating my 10-year class reunion. Um, uh, this year at Knox College, we took this class called uh, Afroidentidad y Hispanidad, and it was talking about the the influence of of Africa in these Spanish speaking countries, where there was again that that uh, mezclando, right? That that mixing of of native peoples, people of European descent, people of African descent. And in some of those countries, you still have concepts like blanqueando la raza to whiten the race, right? Because, you know, to be negro is bad and to be blanco is better. And, and Lisette, you've talked about it a little bit in, in episode one, that, that uh, pigmentocracia, right? That, that with your lighter pigment, you've seen some privilege that has come from that. 
um, where people will say, oh, well, I, I wasn't sure if you were Mexican, mm-hmm. right? Oh, including me, my bad. Um, <laughs> right? But, but um, so, so again, even in how you deal with, with some of that, I think is a part of this conversation of, of the Black-Brown divide. Yes, because what you have is this pushing and pulling of, of needs, right? So these are my interests and I'm going to advocate for this. And as you and I are discussing, they really can be boiled down to uh, we want political power, we want economic uh, prosperity and social acceptance. But how we think we can achieve that is where it differs. And in the way that we prioritize these needs differs, even among Latinos, right? So for Puerto Ricans, the legalization or the pathway to citizenship is not really going to matter to them. No, the way it, citizens. Right, because they're U.S. citizens. They, that wouldn't matter to them the way it would to people who are from Guatemala or, or, or Mexico. And so that, I think, is what creates this challenge. And I, we always talk about that table, right? And it's like we're fighting for scraps, but we're not even at the table. We are fighting for scraps, that, and, and we're not even sitting there. We're not in the room where it happens, <laughs> right? <laughs> and so how do we get there? How do we unite? And how do we get to a point where we could see that we have very similar needs and that by being united, that by being united, we perhaps can, can accomplish more. But I also then want to take it to the social side, right? The social acceptance, because something that often happens to the Latino community is this claim that, that we are somehow unwilling to learn English and we have this added layer of Spanish. But I also see that happening to Black folks and the idea of proper English and Ebonics. So again, that's another similarity where we are looking for that social acceptance, but we have to realize that that notion of proper English is is wrong to begin with. Now, don't get me wrong. There is a time and a place, particularly when we talk about education, right? We definitely want to acknowledge language and, and, and Ebonics and understand that what students hear at home is very different from what we're trying to teach them at school. But ultimately, though, that is something that has been used to, to keep us down, more or less. You know, don't come in here speaking Spanish. Don't come in here with, with your Ebonics. Do you, you want to jump in? I, I do, just because I, I can think of a, a very... You know, I, I used to say difficult conversations, um, and I, I heard somebody speak to this the other day. I was listening to Dr. Sheldon Eakin's podcast, and, and the woman that he was speaking with, who I cannot recall at this moment, but, but she talked about them as healing conversations. So I can think of this healing conversation I needed to have where a teacher had decided to write up a student for speaking Spanish in her class mm. mm-hmm. because it was possible that that student was speaking negatively about her. And there's a little bit of vanity, a little bit of self-centeredness to assume that because somebody is speaking, they're speaking about you. Now, I will say I've been in the store and I've seen black people act a fool if somebody is speaking Spanish in front of them and they'll pretend to speak gibberish and say, ah, okay, your mama too. I don't know what you're saying about me. And, and I've, I've seen it happen. It, Mm-hmm. But but again, to, to bring that into that educational setting, as we both are educators, I think linguistic resources is so paramount to the continued growth of a student that, that if I have to think or speak in Spanish to get to my end goal of being able to express what I'm learning, or if I need to think or speak in, in my home language as a black person, which maybe uh, does not sound the same way that my, my white female middle class teacher speaks, but, I, but it helps me to get to my ultimate end goal, then, then we as educators need to be accepting of that and understand that it is actually not a problem, but instead it is a 
an additional linguistic resource. It's definitely not. We, we definitely approach this as a deficit. And we know now, especially with all the research out there on bilingualism, that this is not a deficit. And we need to shift from that deficit perspective to one that is more additive. And to continue with that social acceptance, though, I kind of want to turn it on to media representation. Because I'm going to put a little plug here, but I recently watched The State of Latinos in the Media 2020. It's on PBS and it's starring, um, I believe his name is Felix Sanchez, and he is the chairman and co-founder of the National Hispanic Foundation for the Arts. And he just made an incredible argument that representation in the media is a civil rights issue. We've often heard you can't be what you cannot see. And some of the statistics that he shared were astounding. Latinos account for about 17.4% of the population. We are the largest non-white population in the U.S., and this is as of 2015. We also have the fastest growing buying power in the nation at $1.5 trillion. And one out of every four movie tickets purchased are, by, are purchased by Latinos. Yet, when we get in front of the camera, we cannot escape stereotypes. We have seen time and time again, particularly for the Mexican people, it's narcos, drug lords, gangbangers. We cannot shake that stereotype. And when I think about my Mexican boys, in classrooms, and this is all that they are seeing, it breaks my heart, you know, and I'm, I'm raising two boys, and I, my husband is white, and if I am trying to instill a sense of pride for their Mexican heritage, I don't really have much to point them to, and so when he framed it as a civil rights issue, it it just clicked. And so if you, any Latinos out there or really anyone who is interested in more information, I definitely recommend it. Um, but he really taught, and here's another one. I just remembered, sorry, another statistic, but between 2012 and 2014, any Latino themed segments on, on the news, only 3% of all news stories were centered around Latinos, 3%, but 64% of those were about crime and or immigration. So what does that do for the viewers who perhaps are not big on movies or or entertainment, but they're news watchers? This is all all that they are seeing. And then we have a president who perpetuates these stereotypes. And so again, I, I really believe that this is another parallel that we share with the Black community is that Maybe not to the same extent, but we have this representation in the media that isn't always the most positive, but it is really bad for Latinos. I would say as we, you know, our our, our title today was the Black Brown Divide. And, And I would say that if we are getting our knowledge about one another's communities from the media, then here is another reason why there is this divide. I had a conversation with someone who was from Kenya and they watched American media. And I asked this woman from Kenya who I went to college with, I asked her would her parents prefer that she married someone from Great Britain or a black person from America? And her answer was definitely someone from Great Britain because the presumption is they have money. And the second thing is, is that the image of the black person, the black American, even in Kenya, a country full of black people, the image of the black American was that of a thug or a hoodlum Mm -hmm. because that's all that they have the opportunity to see. The image, I would argue, of the Mexican-American, if you only watch the news, is that they are all 
low wage earning immigrants. And so there again, we have this image of one another and, and, and you talked about fighting for scraps. Here's, here's what happens. I believe that there are times where based on this image that we see, the Mexican American says, well, at least I'm not the black man. Mm -hmm. And the black man says, well, at least I'm not the Mexican. And they don't realize that they both have historically been treated as second class citizens. And so again, there is this division because if I have to compete for scraps, then I've, I've got to at least outbid the other person competing for scraps, mm -hmm. as opposed to recognizing again that power that could come if we say we are not satisfied with scraps. We, a collective we. Mm -hmm. And so again, going back even to, to our, our mission statement as Black, Brown, and Bilingue, unity between these two, two communities will make a long-term difference in our country. Wow, I couldn't have said it better myself. Maurice, we are running a little long here, and I feel like this is a topic that we can talk about for several episodes, right? But like we uh, tend to do, let's leave the listeners with one thing that we want them to walk away from today or that we want them to think about today. And I don't know, do you feel like we should do another episode on this topic? I, I think that, that there certainly is, is room and maybe it may be that we'll do it a little bit further down the road mm -hmm. and be able to bring some more of the modern conversation in. Um, so, so I'd say it this way, look for another black brown divide <laughs> conversation even if it's not our next episode it'll be something that we'll definitely come back to all right so what's the one thing that you want listeners to think about the one thing i want listeners to think about is that presumed alliance and how we can take it from a presumed alliance between the black and brown communities and how we can make it into an actual alliance because there is room for growth in both of our communities and there is room for allies coming alongside one another in both of our communities to fight for um, just continued civil rights, economic rights, political rights in our country. Wonderful. I think for me is I want to encourage people out there listening to have these uncomfortable conversations because that is how we will begin to heal and move forward. You know, I remember joking with you, Maurice, about that feeling of airing out our dirty laundry, right? I don't think either group wants to do that, but we have to face the reality that there are some things that, that both communities say about one another that we wouldn't be proud to openly say. And so I encourage people, listeners, to have those uncomfortable conversations. And, and it's that muscle. We have to exercise that muscle because you don't get good at having these conversations without actually doing it. So that would be my, my little tidbit. Why don't you go ahead and close out the episode? Folks, we want to thank you again. We are so appreciative of all the love that we've been getting on Twitter and on Facebook. If you enjoyed today's episode, we want to invite you to go ahead and share this episode with a friend. Uh, we are now on Spotify and iTunes is coming soon. Uh, I'm Maurice McDavid, and thank you for being with us here on Black, Brown, and Bilingue. And I'm Lisette Jacobson. Muchas gracias for tuning in.